Many people, when they talk about software engineering, they talk about how much money it makes, you know, the awesome tech companies with their free food and decked out offices, or just the, you know, ability to work from home. And all those things are nice, but there are some things that people leave out, and that is what I'm gonna talk about today. The first thing that no one tells you about software engineering is that being on call is pretty common. In most cases, as engineers, we are responsible for the upkeep and maintenance of any services we write. Even though the normal working hours are from nine to five, the customers using these services can use them at any time, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So this means that we as engineers have to be ready to handle any issues that arise outside of normal working hours. For many tech companies, getting as close to 100% uptime is vital because when you're at a global scale supporting millions of customers, even seconds of downtime could mean losing millions of dollars. This is why also in many companies, if you are on call, you're usually paid for that time based on a percentage of your salary. And being on call is usually done on a rotation basis with your team. So for example, if you have a team of four, you could be on call once a week, every single month. The second thing no one tells you about software engineering is just how many meetings there are. This is something I definitely didn't realize when I first started you know, in the industry, there can just be an insane amount of meetings every single day. There are some days where meetings consume 75% of the day and the other 25% is just your time to actually, you know, get stuff done, your actual work. Many meetings that take place are scrum related meetings, at least for my last job, that's what my meetings were consumed of. For context, scrum is an agile framework that is supposed to help teams become organized and solve problems. Scrum meetings include stand-ups, sprint reviews, sprint retrospectives, and sprint planning. And depending on the duration of your sprints, you may do these meetings often, infrequently, or, you know, or somewhere in between. It's just based off of how your team works. Other meetings that happen are usually more surprise meetings that others may you know, throw on your calendar at random. So it could be going over requirements, getting feedback on something, helping others with questions and the list goes on. The third thing no one tells you about software engineering is that in most cases, data structure and algorithm knowledge is not required to be good at your job. And this is coming from a data structures and algorithm channel. Keyword here is most. Most of this knowledge you will learn from college or just from leak coding. It's not gonna be relevant to you know, complete your day-to-day -day tasks on the job. Some of it is definitely relevant, but knowing how to implement all of the sorting algorithms, tree traversals, you know, dynamic programming approaches, these things aren't likely going to be needed on the job. And although you could argue landing a job requires good data structure and algorithm knowledge, the actual job responsibilities usually don't require the same skill set. You know, you would think that companies would ask the candidate questions directly relating to the job they would be filling, but this just isn't the case. Companies ask these questions because they need to have the fastest way to get through tons and tons of applications and be able to have a clear yes or no for each candidate. The fourth thing no one tells you about software engineering is that writing the code is a very small portion of actually getting it into production. The reality is that many companies make you follow a strict protocol to get code into production. Obviously this depends on the company that you work for, but this could look like planning the work in meetings, estimating how long this task will take, and deciding if it is more important than other tasks. You know, there's design documents where you have to get approval, code reviews requiring multiple approvals as well. You know, maybe security reviews, which is just ensuring the code changes that you made are not like exposing any security vulnerabilities. And then there's maybe QA process and then deploying the code changes. And just because the code was deployed to production, it may not mean the job is done. Depending on the changes done, there may need to be some you know, monitoring of the service to just ensure that things are working as expected. Depending on the complexity and scale of the code changes and the company's protocol, getting work into production can take weeks or sometimes months. The next thing no one tells you about software engineering is that writing tests 
is just as important as writing the code to complete your task. Ensuring your code handles edge cases and is doing its expected result is vital for the stability of your project. Tests are not just important for when the code is first implemented, they're really useful for when you need to make code changes in the future. Having tests means that you can make whatever modifications you need to, but as long as the tests in place are still passing, you know that you didn't break any existing features. It's expected to have code change constantly and having tests is like a safety net. Another reason tests are so important is that it just saves a lot of time. Testing things manually is super time consuming. I don't wanna have to do tedious work, you know, testing each feature whenever a code change is made. The next thing no one tells you about software engineering is that almost any job you take you will have to deal with legacy code. And obviously this isn't, you know, for everyone, but at least in my case, most of the time you're going to have to touch legacy code at some point. Legacy code is, you know, it's a loose term, but it's essentially code that is inherited from someone else. Typically it's not well understood and it's difficult to change because it affects many things. The idea that you will join a company and get to work on something completely from scratch is pretty rare, especially if you are new to the software engineering field. This may not be the case if you join a startup because you know there may not just be many employees, but at least if you're joining maybe a mid-size to large tech company, chances are you're not gonna get to work on something from scratch. Any code base you jump into obviously was written by someone else, whether you know they're at the company now or we're at the company in the past. Not all code is legacy code, but there's always a section of code that just doesn't have great documentation, you know, is extremely complex and just, you know, not many people understand it. The next thing no one tells you about software engineering is that burnout is really common in this field. You know, programming is hard, plain and simple. We have to solve a mix of complex and tedious problems every single day. And although we're not straining our physical body, we are working our mental muscles constantly. That's why often you will hear the term brain melt in this field because, you know, by the end of the day, you feel like you can't even think clearly anymore, you know, just due to how much strain you put on your brain mentally. And, you know, when you have a deadline to hit and you're working more than 40 hours a week, on top of being on call, you know, it can lead to burnout very, very quickly. Burnout will cause you to not feel motivated to work and performing even the most mundane tasks can be way harder than normal. And that's why it's so important, you know, to take breaks throughout the day and actually use any vacation or sick days you need, you know, to get your mind right. The next thing no one tells you about software engineering is that it sometimes can be very boring and dull. And most things you work on aren't going to be the most cutting edge and exciting tasks. You know, I work as a backend engineer and at my last job, many of the things I worked on was just implementing new API endpoints. That's literally all I did. I wasn't working on, you know, some amazing AR technology or the next TikTok, but you know, that's just the reality of work. And even now working at Google, although it is very exciting, not every task is the most fun thing I've ever done. That's why it's so important to join a team or a company that has a tech stack you are interested in working in. The next thing no one tells you about software engineering is that the code you write is not everlasting. The last thing you should think when you are done implementing code is that it will never be touched again. It very well could change the very next week, month, or year. Writing software is hard. Gathering requirements and implementing them exactly how stakeholders or clients want them is a real challenge. The reality is that requirements will change all the time, even when it is horrible timing. So with that, don't get attached to the code that you write. If you worked on something for a month or someone had to scratch everything you did, you know, yeah, that it's gonna suck, but just realize it's an annoying part of working as a software engineer. The last thing no one tells you about software engineering is that levels are sometimes based on compensation ranges, not skill. Obviously this is very company specific, but when you think of a level one engineer, level two, level three, 
you would think that as you climb higher in the levels, that your day-to-day -day tasks will be drastically different. At one of my old jobs, we had level one, level two, level three, and then a senior engineer. So I started as a level one, and after a year, I got promoted to level two. And being there for a long time, I became familiar with the responsibilities you know, of the level threes and of senior engineers. And based on that experience, the work was always very similar, if not exactly the same, no matter the level. The reality was that every level had a certain pay range. So for example, level one would make between 75 and 90K, level two between 90K and 105K, et cetera. Not every company is like this, but this is very common if you were to join a big tech company. Many of these things that I've mentioned, you'll come to find out when you land your first engineering job, or if you know you're already in the field, you likely have come across most of these things. If you're new to the field, you should check out my other video going over the common mistakes that junior developers make. It might be useful for you. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. And with that, I'll see you all next time.